All right. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Phil Klein. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me, and thank you all for uh, attending. Uh, there will be opportunities to ask questions, and you can, I guess, go into the chat thing. Is that what it is, Leah, the chat? Um, yeah, they can ask or, in the chat. Yeah, or if you might even have the opportunity to unmute yourself and ask a question verbally. I'll stop periodically uh, and ask for questions. Has everybody got their handouts? Because I really follow the handouts, and it'll be easier, better if you've got your handouts. I don't think they have email handouts. from Leah. I think I forgot to send them to them. You didn't send them? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't remember getting them, so I guess I didn't send them. If you I can send them. them. Can you... I can link oh. them in the chat. Give me a, just a moment. No, we okay. didn't get them. I will. Uh, I'll take care of that, and while you keep going. Okay. All right. Just let me know if you didn't get them, because I, I I'm pretty sure I sent them. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, this is still going to work out okay, even if you don't have your uh, handouts. Um, there is one uh, handout that it would be better for you to have it. It's called Dogs Don't Bite Out of the Blue. And it's also on my website on the resources page. And my website is fillthedoglistener.com, just so you, you're, you're aware of it. And um, that way, I love phone calls. So if you get to my um, website, you'll see that my phone number is 860-604-0996. Again, 860-604-0996. And I welcome phone calls every day of the week from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. If you call me before 9 in the morning or after 9 at night, you're very unlikely to reach me. Okay. Could you anyway, repeat the phone number? The last time you did, there was only six numbers after the area. Okay, so my, my number again is 860-604-0996. And if you Google fill the dog, dog listener, you will find me, okay? It'll come up on, on uh, Google or whatever search engine you're using. So we are going to cover tonight the key behavioral factors that drive dog behavior. Um, we are going to cover uh, our interactions with our dogs. In other words, our conversations and how they affect their behavior. Uh, we are going to cover the solutions, uh, 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 the, the dog-friendly changes you need to make in your interactions with your dogs to eliminate uh, unwanted behaviors and restore harmony to your pack. And uh, you're going to get a little information about dog listening. I know you're not here to be marketed to, uh, but I'll just mention that dog listening is based entirely on the nature of the dog. The methodology was developed by Jan Fennell, the dog listener, and um, her son, Tony, was instrumental in helping her, and Tony's also a dog listener. He's located in France and Australia, and Jan is located in the UK. I'm not sure, I think she's still pretty active too. And what I mean by based on the nature of the dog, it's based on canine instincts. We're gonna cover that in a minute. Dog listening is 100% dog friendly. We don't do anything to intimidate a dog, harm it, we don't yell at it no harmful gadgets. All you gotta do is send out the right signals at the right times. And we'll get into some of those signals. Phil, uh, real quick, um, I put the, a link to the, the, uh, the handouts in the chat. So if anyone wants that, just click on that link and you'll get to open it. Okay. And by the way, if you're, if you're getting the, the, the handouts, I'm not gonna say anything that you'll miss if you're busy trying to get handouts, okay? Um, I do all my I do all the training sessions through Zoom. Tonight is a good slice of a session that would be held with you and your and your family, uh, with you in your home and me sitting here at my computer. Um, so, and by the way, my this what I do is patterned after what used to be my in-home consultation. Uh, I have a uh, health issue 
uh, my balance is is uh, off. Of course, there's people who think that I've been off balance my whole life. Um, but anyway, I don't go into people's homes anymore. I wish I still could. But it's not a drawback to not go into your home, okay? And the other thing is, if you are the pack leaders of your dogs, they will behave well voluntarily. Okay, that's the theory of dog listening. If you're the leaders, your dogs will behave well voluntarily because in a wild pack of canines, whether it's wolves or wild dogs or dingoes or whatever, as long as they're canines, coyotes, uh, canines cooperate instinctively with their leaders. Now, we're, this is gonna run about an hour and a half with some time for questions. Uh, In-home consultations usually take four to six sessions of anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half each. So I'm not gonna be able to get into all the details tonight, but I hope to give you enough information to get you started and to help you start solving some of your, 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 uh, your behavioral issues with your dogs, okay? All righty, so the key behavioral factors, believe it or not, are a dog's canine instincts inherited from the wolf pack. We took the dog out of the wolf pack, but we have not taken the wolf pack instincts out of the dog. So no matter what breed your dog is, what it looks like, um, they all speak canine language, which is one of the things that I teach. And I also teach you to think like your dog. So it doesn't matter whether you've got a little five pound dog or a hundred pound mastiff, they all function the same way and they all speak the same language. And if that's not enough to convince you, uh, dogs and wolves share in common 99.7% of their DNA. As long as you got the right size dog, not necessarily the right breed, but the right size, you could breed a dog with a wolf and start a new bloodline. In fact, dogs, wolves, and coyotes interbreed. And the typical Eastern coyote that we have in Connecticut, which is bigger than the Western coyote, because it is 60, about 64% coyote, 26% wolf, that's why it's bigger, and 10% dog, all right? So what are these instincts that dog has inherited from the wolf? It wants to be part of a pack, needs to know where it fits in the pack and has to have a leader, a qualified leader. Otherwise dogs think just like wolves that without a qualified leader, the pack will not survive. So we've got, uh, we've got canine instincts and right away we need to tie personality to that because each dog has a different personality. It does not matter what breed it is. You know, we're all humans, but we each have different personalities, okay? And in the wild, uh, canines that get to be the leaders are the only ones to be, that are suited to be the leaders. They've got to have the personality uh, for the job which is, you know, you want a canine that is confident, decisive, you know, has a leadership orientation, wants to be in charge, uh, and is calm under pressure, among other things. Most of our dogs do not fit that personality profile. A nervous, anxious, or high-strung dog, or a dog that's introverted, you know, or a dog that's shy, um, that's not a good personality to be a leader. In fact, wolves with the personalities of our dogs would never be leaders in the wild because the pack would not allow them to be leaders. The pack would not survive with, with, you know, with leadership that's not qualified. So in order for you to be leaders, in your dog's eyes, you have to be qualified, okay? Now, the other two factors that are important or the most important factors are a dog's environment and how we interact with it. In other words, conversations amongst pack mates. So environment is your home, your yard, that's the dog's territory, the sights, the sounds, the smells, what goes on in your home, whether you're just the only person there or there's you know, multiple people and maybe multiple dogs, 
If a dog winds up as the pack leader, the, the more the hecticness, the more the people, the more the, the uh, canines that the dog feels responsible for, uh, the more pressure on the dog. Likewise, the more territory that you go in with your dog, the more pressure on the dog. So it's not a good idea for a dog that has the wrong personality to be a leader because that's where the behavioral challenges come from. And two of the most important behavioral challenges that are associated with leadership are nervous aggression and, and separation anxiety. So let me ask you guys a question. We're, we're gonna get into more detail, by the way. If, if you will raise your hands, how many of you do your dogs follow you around your home? Anybody wanna raise their hand? Okay, I see a bunch of hands going up. And you probably don't wanna answer this question, but I'm gonna ask it, but I'll answer it, okay? Why do you think your dog follows you around your home? Food. Anybody wanna venture a guess? Food. Okay, food. Anything else? Uh, my dog's a rescue. I thought it was fear of being abandoned. Okay, all right. Because you're the leader. Because you're, who's the leader? You are the person, the owner. Okay, well, let's, and let's, let's look. Because you're the leader. Okay, well, let's look at the dynamics in, in, a, um, in a pack. All right, if your dog, you're, if, let, let, me, let me ask, let me pose this. If you had a two-year-old toddler in your home and it went into another room, what would you do? Wouldn't you go to see if the, the toddler's okay? It's not getting harmed? Yes. <laughs> okay, so why do you think your dog is following you around your home? Watching Protect. out for you. Yeah, because the dog is protecting you. So guess who, I don't want to humanize dog, but you know, leaders are kind of like parents. So guess who's the parent in your home at the top of the pecking order? Oh. The dog is, okay? That's why it's following you. Yes, it loves you, but its primary reason for following you is because it thinks it's got to take care of you. So a dog that is leader in our world has about the same job as it would have in the wild, which is to be responsible for the survival of its pack but the dog is in a world that doesn't understand when it's in our world. They adapt to it, but they don't understand it. So being a leader is a high pressure job for a dog. And we wanna get that monkey off its back if we can. And we put the monkey on its back inadvertently based on how we interact with the dog. And we are going to get into that. So if we get the big scary job off the dog's back, then what's its jobs? Well, this is gonna sound good to you, eat, sleep, and play. <laughs> okay. And that's its only jobs, except uh, it's good for a subordinate pack member to be the, a sentinel. In other words, alert you to dangers. Okay. He is. So, so um, that's an okay job. And by the way, if you're wondering, you know, especially if you got the size dog that it would afford some protection for you, physical protection, is that, you know, if somebody tries to invade your home, just because you're the leader doesn't mean that the dog isn't going to join you and try to get rid of that danger, okay? So, so the, and the thing that matters most is our interactions with our dogs. You cannot change their personalities. You cannot change their instincts. There's not a heck of a lot you can do for, to the environment. And Okay, so this is all based on your interactions with your dogs. So please stop blaming your dogs for their unwanted behaviors. You created them. But the good news is that by changing your interactions with your dogs, you can get rid of those behaviors in a kind, lasting way. Now, how do we get kind of get in trouble with our dogs? Um, first of all, we apply human thinking to them. Okay, in other words, we, uh, we, we think that they think like us. You know, people tell me that when there's a danger, their dogs get mad. They don't get mad, they might get scared, um, but, but they, don't get, they don't get mad. If your dog pulls on the leash and you oblige it, you walk with it while it's pulling, 
then you're rewarding pulling, right? Which is actually inadvertently reward, rewarding unwanted behavior. We reinforce undesirable behaviors. If your dog sits in front of you for attention and barks and barks and barks or whines and whines and whines or keeps pawing on your leg or whatever, whatever persistent behavior it, it uses, uh, or some, some cases dogs even nip to get, get attention. And if you make eye contact, talk to your dog or pet it, when it is pestering you, you've just rewarded unwanted behavior. You'll never get rid of it, okay? If your dog pesters you while you're eating, you know, jumps on you, jumps on your cabinets, that kind of stuff. If you just proceed to prepare its meal and give it to it, you're rewarding unwanted behavior. I'm gonna come back to human thinking in, in a minute. And last, we give our dogs that unwanted high pressure job of being pack leader. Now, what's the human, what, what do I mean by applying human thinking to our dogs? How do dogs figure out where they fit in the pack and who is in charge? They do it by asking us who's in charge. And how do they do that? They seek our attention. And by the way, if your dog has to go out, that's why it's seeking your attention. Y'all better let it out. That's an exception. Or if your dog is trying to alert you to something going on on the outside that it wants you to pay attention to, you better pay attention to it because it's trying to warn you of a danger or something out there that it's concerned about, okay? But if your dog comes up to you with those cute eyes, maybe puts its chin on your knee, it's really asking you who's in charge now, you or me? And here's the tough thing. You have to ignore that request for behavior and tell your dog that you're in charge not and don't tell it that it's in charge because if you give it attention immediately you're telling it it's in charge so i want to think of you to think about how many times a day you do this that your dog start, initiates the interaction with you now the good news is doesn't mean you have to disregard your dog for very long but you but you don't want to make eye contact talk to it or pet it let it walk away four steps and then you can call it back and give it all the love you want because now you're giving it love on your terms. So when you disregarded it in the first place, you sent a leadership signal. And when the dog comes back to you, when you called it, uh, you, the dog subordinated itself to you because its movement is toward you, not the other way around. So you sent it another leadership signal. So that's just an example of what I'm talking about. We're going to get into more information about this. Now, where do you, what are the areas in which you need to make these dog-friendly changes? Uh, they are status, feeding. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff under status. And if you've got your handouts now, we'll get to that in a minute, OK? Um, handling danger. Leaders make decisions about dangers, not subordinate pack members. Lead the hunt is another area, and right away you're going to start thinking, this guy must, must have been uh, off his rocker, or must be off his rocker. What is he talking about, lead the hunt? I don't take my dog hunting. Well, all dogs have the hunting instinct. They inherited it from the wolf, and as soon as they hit the air, they think they are hunting. There is no such thing as a walk as we know it in the canine world. That's our invention. It's not the dog's invention. It thinks it, as soon as it hits the air, it thinks it's hunting. Even if you just let it out the back door into your fenced in yard. And then the last area is play. So we'll get, we'll get into that, okay? So this is the overview. Anybody have any questions about what we covered so far as we are going to take a quick walk through the next handout, which is dogs don't bite out of the blue. And that article is also on my website if you don't have it in your hands yet. I hope you can access it. And it says right at the top of the article, a high percent, and this is one of the reasons why I included this article. And by the way, 77% of the dog bites are inflicted by the family dog or a friend's dog. 
So the dog knew the person and vice versa, okay? So a high percentage of bites can be prevented by avoiding eye contact and not invading a dog's space. And then if you look at under the pictures where it says dog don't, don't, dogs don't bite out of the blue, many bites can be pre prevented if people learn to read a dog's body language. So these are some of the examples of body language that you want to look for. I mean, this dog, this article is geared toward meeting a strange dog, whether your dog is strange, is whether your dog is meeting a stranger or you're meeting uh, a, stra a dog, a strange dog. Okay. But I just wanted you to have um, this information. There's only one dog that's ready to meet somebody new. That is the German Shepherd up at the top left column. The, the rest of the dogs are in some state of not being sure, uh, being uncomfortable or being under pressure. So I'm not gonna go through all of these. You can, you know, you, you can obviously read the captions. Uh, some of the things that are missing here, of course, is if a dog is growling or barking, uh, that's not a good dog to meet. If it's hackles are up, that's not a good dog to meet. If it's blinking its eyes, that may not be a good dog to meet, okay? And if it's nervously nervously, nervously holding up a paw and that paw is kind of vibrating, that probably is not a good dog to meet now. And what's a safe way to meet a dog? Get the dog's name and call it to you. That way you don't have to invade its space. And if it comes to you, it means that it is comfortable with you. And by the way, if it comes to you, um, don't put your hand over its head because that's kind of a dominant position for a dog. And if a dog is protecting its owner, it may be more apt to bite. Um, the good news is that a very low percentage of dogs bite. But why do you want to run into the one that's going to bite you if you make eye contact and go toward its face? In fact, if you lock eyes with a dog, uh, they might just think you are a threat because we have periscoping eyesight. They have the same eyesight. They lock eyes with, a, with prey when they're going to go after prey. So that can be intimidating to a dog. All right, so I, there's, there's more information here. But even with your own dog, does anybody have a dog where if you, if you walk, go into its space and try to take it by the collar, it, it, it gives it growls at you or warns you in some way. Okay, I see some people nodding their heads. So don't go into the dog space, call it to you. All right. There's another reason for not going. Okay, we're, anybody have any questions about the article? I'm going fast, so we're gonna have time for more questions. And you know, you can always contact me if you have questions. I love talking with people. By the way, there is, we're having a, a bit, I don't know, you can probably can't hear the thunder. We got some thunder and my dog has moved right next to me. She's lying on the floor next to me. So if you see me bend down and put a hand on her, I'm just trying to tell her that this is not a problem. She doesn't have to worry about it, okay? I'm not going to play poor dog with her. I'm not going to pet her because then she's gonna think I'm scared too. Okay, so if your dog gets upset about fireworks or thunder, uh, it may run into another room. And that's okay if it calms it down. But if you want to help it calm down, uh, call it to you and hold it by your side or go get it and hold it by your side if you can. Don't pet it. Don't make eye contact. Don't talk to it. Just hold on to it. And that's, that's, that's a, a, a reaction to danger that the dog knows instinctively you're doing something called a calm hold and if you're calm and you just do that then your dog will calm down because you're saying this is not a problem but if you do poor dog routine and you start peddling it and petting it and cuddling it believe it or not you're telling the dog you're scared so that's not going to help it Eric, okay? do you have a question yeah uh yeah i do uh, real quick is it, is it okay to look into your own dog's eyes only we're going to, well, since you asked it, I might as well cover it now. Only when you want something from it. Because ta making eye contact with a dog 
or talking to it, we got a good thunderstorm going here, or talking to it um, puts pressure on the dog and confuses it if you don't tell it what you want. See, eye contact works differently in the canine world than it does our world. In the, in the, in the canine world, it means action. We make eye contact because a lot of times because we're taught to, to show that we're paying attention, we care, we're interested, whatever, okay? Uh, a dog in the canine world, you're gonna only make, with eight canines, you're only gonna make eye contact when you want something and be sure to tell your dog what you want and talking works the same way. So if you want your dog to come to you, by all means, if it's in line of sight, make eye contact and then pleasantly call it to you. Like with the come command, you say your dog's name, I'm gonna say, Fido, come. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna act like I'm gonna be happy to see the dog to motivate her to come to me or him to come to me, okay? So that's what, that's what you're going to do. And you can clap your hands or even whistle to help motivate your dog to come to you. But even if your dog doesn't comply, at least it knew what you wanted, so that doesn't cause confusion or put pressure on a dog. So thank, thank you. you for asking about that. Again, thank don't you. make eye contact or talk unless you want something. And by the way, when your dog comes to you, you can have a nice little conversation with it. And for those of you whose dogs react to its name, don't even say its name unless you want something from it. But you can talk all you want if your dog is in the same room with you as long as you don't say its name or make eye contact. Then they, they, they don't think you're talking to them. Okay, is that, is that clear? All right. And by the way, this is a biggie because talking and eye contact are acknowledgement. So if your dog is doing something you don't want it to do and you make eye contact with it or talk to it, you have just reinforced unwanted behavior. You don't have to pet it to reinforce unwanted behavior. In fact, in dog listening, there are no verbal corrections. And the corrections, by the way, are, are at the, uh, are, are, are in the, uh, <clears throat> I think I'm out. They're, they're in the, they're, the corrections are in the last handout. The, do, the um, the title at the top is the leadership signals memory jogger. So at the bottom of that page, those are the corrections. We either ignore the behavior, uh, we might push the dog away if it invades our space, but we don't push it too hard to, to, to hurt it. Redirect it, take it by the collar and walk it in a different direction. That's if it's not going to get upset us about us taking it by the collar. Uh, time out is you separate your dog from the pack by putting it in another room. They don't like to be separated from the pack. Uh, and that's good to cure persistent behavior like jumping, barking, and even aggressive behavior, okay? And then the last correction is movement. We stop all movement to correct and we move to reward. So this is handy if you got a dog that pulls, as an example. Your dog starts pulling, you're either gonna stop and change direction or you're gonna stop all movement and hold your ground, okay? And you're not gonna move until the dog releases the tension in the leash. And the instant it does, you move because the movement is the reward. You don't need to talk to the dog to reward it under certain circumstances. So the dog catches on after a while that if I pull, we're not going anywhere. And if there's slack in the leash, we keep going, which is what the dog wants. Okay, so that's just a quick rundown of um, the uh, corrections. Any questions so far? I, yes, uh, Beth, go ahead. So I have a question. All of the, what would fit for a correction if your dog steals? Steals what? Every, like your eyeglasses off the table or something to get your attention, but you don't want your, <laughs> eyeglasses damaged or your remote or like what okay. would be the right because he bites he okay bites. prevention is the best thing you can do don't put stuff where your dog can access it now why is it stealing stuff if it's not food it's stealing it to get your attention because it gets attention when it does these things doesn't it 
In fact, you get upset, of course, I can understand this. Do you get upset when your dog steals your glasses? Does your dog chew up your glasses or your remote? My dog, you know, I had a dog that chewed up a $500 pair of glasses. Not a happy camper. But guess what happens if you get upset with your dog and you start yelling at it? Okay, nobody wants to guess. I, that's that's not I'm probably not asking a fair question. You reward it. Dog thinks you're unstable. Right. You'll never be a leader. Oh. See, it, it does. We're getting into the dog friendly principles now, and number four down is be calm. It does no good to get upset with your dog because then your dog thinks you are crazy and you're not suitable to be a leader. All right, so you have to stay calm no matter what. And you're going to start thinking, hey, Phil, you know, we're humans. We get upset sometimes. Yes, we all do. But if you start singing when you start feeling upset, you won't stay upset. Okay? And try it sometime. And maybe you've got your own way of, of bringing yourself down. But it's hard to stay upset when you're singing the Beatles song, Good Day Sunshine. I can tell you that from personal experience. I'm a lousy singer, by the way, okay? So we have to be calm at all times because you're eroding the trust you're trying to build with your dog to become a leader. It's counterproductive to get upset with a dog. And by the way, you'll eventually find out like I did, and I'm, I'm, I've gotten much better at this, is not to get upset with human beings either. It doesn't really do any good. You can get what you want without getting too upset about it. And I see somebody really shaking his head a lot, but I'm not going to say who it is. I'm not going to embarrass this person. Okay. <laughs> By the way, can I ask a question though to take it one step further. If, sure. What do you do if the dog's got your glasses and you're not upset? You're singing the Beatles song. You're not making eye contact, but you really don't want the dog to do that anymore. What do okay. you do? Okay. Okay. So, so if you if you if you didn't prevent the dog, you didn't put your glasses where the dog couldn't reach it. You got three options. And one of these takes some courage. You, you want to carry treats with you in your pockets, little treats. It could be the kibble that you use, okay? If your dog grabs your glasses, you know, tr call it to you and call it, call a dog to you and trade them for a food reward, okay? Now, if your dog, if that doesn't work or your dog figures out the game and starts stealing stuff to get a food reward, then you go to option two, which is you surreptitiously you know you secretively drop a treat on the floor and the dog thinks whoa hey you know treat time but it doesn't think it came from you so it goes and it drops the glasses and goes and gets the treat now here's the one that requires courage and i got a back in the day when there were blackberry phones i got my blackberry phone back from a 90 pound dog and by the way that phone fit very nicely on its tongue <laughs> I, gra I grabbed my phone and it, you know, the, it wasn't going to, the first two options didn't work. In fact, I leaned a little bit toward the dog. It started growling at me. So I wasn't going to try to get it out of its mouth. Okay. <clears throat> and so, and, and it wasn't going to come to me either. So I says that a couple that I was working with, Hey, we're going down to that bathroom. You just re, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> had redone. And we're going to close ourselves into the bathroom. That's why I said it took courage. Well, we closed the door. We closed ourselves in the bathroom, counted to 10. I opened the door. Shadow was, you know, where'd you guys go? He was at the bathroom door and my Blackberry was on the living room rug. And I picked it up <laughs> safely and got it back. Dog was not harmed. That was my concern. Okay. But if you, you know, if you give the dog attention for stealing stuff, guess what? You're rewarding it. It's going to keep stealing it. If you leave it where it can steal it, it's going to steal it, especially since it knows it's going to get attention, your attention, okay? Isn't so the um, dog is using the thing as a tool. Isn't trading a treat also kind of rewarding him for taking your glasses? Well, if he figures out the game, because it's not necessary, he may not necessarily make the connection, but if he starts making the connection, then you don't use that option anymore. You go to option two, which is to drop the treat, you yeah. know, kind of clandestinely, secretively. Okay. Can you so just say leave it? Oh, you're talking to him. So you're, <laughs> you're confusing the dog. You're giving the dog a mixed message. You know, leave it means drop it, right? Yeah. 
but you've now acknowledged the behavior. So what do you want your dog to do? If you can get it to drop it that way, okay, but I would switch to the other methodology that doesn't give you the, your dog attention for stealing it in the first place. You know, do the prevention so your dog is not gonna steal it in the first place. There's one other thing you need to know about eyeglasses and other things that you cherish, remotes, whatever your dog grabs is a trophy to the dog. It's about its status in the pack. And the one who they grab trophies to elevate their status in the pack. We have Again, a, um, we have a charge. question Where in the they chat. Fit? What? We have a question in the chat um, yeah, related to this. What if my dog won't come to me and we play a game of chase and get? Oh, chase and get? You're going to chase the dog? If the, I assume if the dog has the, let's say it's the glasses and won't drop them and you end up chasing the dog around to get them. What do okay, you do? Okay, so who's, who's at the front of the pack then? Who's the leader? The dog. The dog. Yeah. So chasing it's not going to help. You're, you're only proving that the dog is the leader. <laughs> that's a great example of human thinking, by the way, that we think that somehow or other that's going to solve the problem. In fact, the dog might start doing a little exercise with you, start changing direction and stopping and, you know, kind of playing with you. So it's now training you, by the way. It's doing something we call stop, start, change direction to show you leadership. Okay. There, there's a guy, I love, I, I love a certain gentleman here who is just, he's got his hands, oh, I shouldn't say, I won't say anything because I'll, I'll give him away. I don't want to give him away. We all know it's all right, Eric. Let's... We can see him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. Anyway, okay, so let's do dog friendly principles real quick. All right. And then we'll go jump back into the signals. This is fun, by the way. I love questions. I'm glad you guys are asking questions. And I love the reactions too. You know what? The, the looks on your faces. Some of you with the look of disbelief, you know. All right, so now let's go to dog friendly principles. Number one is it's what you do that counts, not what your dog does. So this is, this is it. It's all about how you interact with your dog. It's not what your dog does, it's your reaction. It's your interactions with your dog that create the behavior that you don't want. So please stop blaming your dog you know, don't get a case of guilt about yourself or blame yourself either. Just make the dog friendly changes that we're talking about. And it takes time. You know, just because all of a sudden you're showing up and acting like a leader, your dog is gonna say, your dog is not gonna think in canine terms, hallelujah, you finally stepped up, you know? It, you're gonna have to convince your dog that you're the leader. So you have to, you see down here, it says consistent, be consistent you're gonna to have to consistently send it leadership signals and its behavior will start changing. But you probably won't be entrenched as a leader for several weeks or maybe even months, okay? And then you need to keep using the signals because if you think, ha ha, now we got it made and you go back to your old ways, the dog will take back leadership because it's gotta have a leader. And if you, if you turn into a juvenile delinquent again, your dog is gonna take back the leadership. See, a lot of you, think, a lot of you, your dogs think you're juvenile delinquents. They can't give up leadership to you. The pack won't survive. You're not qualified, okay? This is what the dog is thinking, whether you wanna believe me or not. This is what the dog is thinking, all right? All right, so. Uh, it's what, don't blame the dog. It's how you're interacting with the dog. You're going to make the leadership decisions. And one of the most important one we've already talked about, when does the dog get attention? If it gets it on its terms, except for going out and going to the bathroom um, or alerting you to danger. There's one other one, but I'm not going to get into that tonight, okay? Uh, but the two most important exceptions are going to the bathroom um, or alerting you to danger. If you, you know, if it can get you to interact, for other reasons, you're telling it every time it's in charge. All right, so so you want that's the that's the most important leadership decision you could make, is 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 not telling the dog you're it's in charge that you're in charge. Okay, uh, so you're going to make the decisions non-confrontational. We already talked about that. We're not going to intimidate the dog. Use harmful gadgets. No force. No violence. Be calm. Be consistent, you're gonna make mistakes, that's okay.
but you've got to use the leadership signals consistently, okay? And by the way, if you make the mistake of making eye contact with your dog uh, by mistake, use it. Call the dog to you, all right? And then that way you've used the eye contact. It's no longer a mistake. Uh, let's see, where are we now? And by the way, consistency is convincing. The other thing is dogs got to be able to connect the dots. You've got to reward it right away in a matter of seconds when, you, when it does something positive that you've asked it to do. Otherwise, it doesn't know what it's being rewarded for. You know, if you let your dog, if you take your dog out and it does its business outside and then you bring it back in and give it a cookie, your dog has no idea why it's being rewarded. It doesn't think that it's getting rewarded because it went to the bathroom outside. In fact, you didn't, if you didn't ask your dog to do anything, it's just getting a free cookie. Speaking right. of going outside, um, we had a question in the chat. Is it okay to use a bell system for them to go out or does that send a mixed signal that they can decide when to go out? Well, you know, any signal can be tricky. And so they might start ringing the bell just to get your attention or to, or to go out. So now you've got to figure out, that's a judgment call. Should I let, let the dog out or take it out? Um, if you, you know, take it out and it, you know the dog just went to the bathroom 15 minutes ago, peed and pooped, I would ignore that signal. Because sometimes you have to ignore other signals. Now I'm lucky, the only time my pooch wants to go out uh, is when she seeks my attention. So I know she wants to go out when she comes looking for attention, almost without exception. And then of course I know whether or not I've let her out recently too, or taken her out, I can't let her out, I've got to take her out. Okay, so it's a judgment call. But you're going to have to ignore that ringing bell sometimes, especially if the dog figures that you know figures it out. It might be ringing it every ten minutes, all right. But it might be pestering you for attention every ten minutes too. So you you know you could always change. You could always stop using the bell. You can go you can go to something else. Um, all right. So we did uh, be oh yeah. So the be convincing is you've got to either reward the dog and under more, most circumstances use a correction quickly so that it knows why it's being given a, a consequence of behavior, whether positive or negative, all right? Uh, patience and persistence, I don't think I need to uh, explain. We have to be patient and persistent with our dogs. Plan ahead or think ahead. We're gonna go through something called a reuniting ritual because we're gonna mimic the signals that the dog is looking for, okay? So you might, when you, well, you're gonna think about when you wake up in the morning, I've gotta reunite with my dog, well, what is that? So you might go, you might just rehearse it in your own mind. Uh, that's what I mean by think ahead. What am I gonna do with my dog next, okay? Learn from mistakes and move on. That's a good way of, of, of just op operating our lives. We're all gonna make mistakes, so might as well just learn from them and then move on, okay? Make training fun for you and your dog. Don't overtrain. You don't have to train for a whole half hour straight to be effective. If you can and your dog is good about it and you're good about it, you don't get too tense, the dog doesn't get too excited, fine. But five minutes here and five minutes there will do the trick, okay? You know, five minutes of practicing recall when the commercials come on TV is very helpful, okay? Holy mackerel, we got a we got a monsoon here. Um, all right, so so uh, don't overtrain. That's what that means. Have a party when your dog performs as requested. When I used to go into people's homes, I saw them, you know, call their dog to them, uh, kind of weekly, and then not even giving the dog praise for coming to them. You know, if you want your dog to 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 um, uh, to listen to you. You got to praise it when it does as requested. You know, praise it, give it some love, and, and you know, and, and at times give it food rewards. But don't give so many food rewards that now the dog will only perform for food rewards. So when you start getting your dog more consistently, say, re coming to you with recall, then make the food rewards more random. Okay. 
Uh, so that's what I mean by have a party and have fun. And by the way, training a dog is fun. If you look at it as fun, it is fun. If you look at it as, you know, as a, a boring task, then it is a boring task. So it depends on your point of view, but have fun. We all got dogs to have fun. Questions? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go into the leadership signals. We have done some of these already. So we're now under the leadership signals memory jogger. And by the way, these are all documents that you get from me, um, except for the cover document. Uh, when we do a, uh, when I do an in-home consultation with somebody. You also get a consultation summary, which is a much more expanded version of what you've got here. Uh, this leadership signals memory jogger is meant to be posted as a reminder, but it's also a good outline, okay? So status, movement. If you go to your dog, you're paying homage to your dog. So unless you're gonna go to your dog to correct it or prevent it from being harmed, always call your dog to you. So for any positive interaction, you want your dog's movement toward you so that it's paying homage to you, subordinating itself to you, not the other way around. So if you want to give it a cookie, call it to you. If you want to put its leash on, call it to you. If you want to take its leash off, take a step back and invite the dog, excuse me, into your space so your movement is not toward the dog. But if you want to take it by the collar and redirect it, then you can go to it. Or if you if if um, you want to prevent it from being harmed, you can go to it. You know, preventing our dogs from being harmed takes precedence over everything else. All right, so that's movement. It's simple. You want to you want to interact with your dog? Call it to you. Eye contact and talking. We already talked about. Eye contact and talk only when you want something from your dog, then be sure to tell it what you want. Affection and attention. We've talked about your dog is seeking affection to find out where it fits in the pack. So except for going out, going to the bathroom and alerting you to a danger, you are going to disregard your dog. Disregarding is no eye contact, no talking, no pet. Let it walk four steps away. And then you can call it back and give it all of you want, all right? Separation is in the same ballpark. In the wild, leaders come and go as they please. Subordinate members do not worry about their leaders leaving the pack. They know they're capable of taking care of themselves. They don't think they have to go with them to take care of them, okay? So, Immediately prior to separation to mimic the signals in this area, immediately prior to your separating from your dog, closing a door, dog is on one side, you're on the other, or going to sleep, okay? You're not gonna interact with your dog. When you, when you come back from a separation, whether it's because you went to the bathroom, you went to the garage, you went to the grocery store, or you went to work, you are gonna go through a reuniting ritual because canines always reset the pack, pecking order when they reunite, when they rejoin the pack. And leaders do not interact with other canines, the subordinate members, until they have reinforced their leadership. So we are going to mimic that by either when we wake up which is separation, or we come back from having closed the door, we're going to disregard our dogs. No eye contact, talking, or petting. See, it's always the same story. You want the dog, there's two versions of this. You want your dog to go lie down, relax for five minutes, and when it has done that, so you're not gonna interact with it, you want the dog to go lie down, relax for five minutes, and when it has done that, you can call your dog to you and give it all the love you want. So it almost looks like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a takeoff on the drill of when the dog is just, you're hanging out together and it seeks your attention. Now, if you start doing this, what's going to happen is your dog, when you return from a separation, is going to uh, spend lots, less and less time trying to get your attention so what you can do is it, what you can do once that 
once your dog is practically spending very little time seeking your attention, you can let it walk away and then you can call it back and give it all the love you want. Okay. And by the way, the five minute version at first, we use that to make sure the dog is done with its repertoire of trying to get our attention and to teach it self control because we want our dogs to control themselves as much as possible. So we don't have to spend as much time on their behavioral issues. This is, this is what I mean by your dog behaving well voluntarily, okay? I so don't I have, have a question to... if that's okay. Yes. Okay, so just taking that scenario, you ignore your dog, even though they're jumping up and down and like going crazy because they're so glad to see you. All right, yep. my dog does that. And especially like if somebody walks in the room, my daughter walks in the room, even if she's gone 10 minutes, she walks in the room and the dog goes crazy. And okay. so, so to okay. play out your scenario, ignore the dog completely. Don't make eye contact. Don't do anything. Don't acknowledge your presence. Correct. Now that you've got, you've come jumping up. around and like what? annoying you. Okay. Now you've, you've raised an excellent question because why is the dog jumping? So you already nailed it. If your daughter, when she was three years old, walked out the door and you didn't know where she went, what would be your state of mind? I'd be worried. Yes, that would, that's an understatement, right? right? You might be frantic, right? right? That's separation anxiety, by the way. You, you, any of you and your dogs have separation anxiety. What's it's thinking when you walk out the door is I've lost my baby. I don't mean to insult you, but that's kind of what it's akin to. So you, so that if your three-year-old child came back 20 minutes later, what would you be doing? You'd Jumping be for thrilled. joy, right? Right. My baby's back. So that's, you know, so that's, that, that's what's going on. The dog thinks it's the parent and you're the three-year-old children it's got to take care of. So that's you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're saying that when the dog does, now this is an adult child, not a child, baby child. Yeah, when it this, doesn't, but it, it doesn't matter. It's the same deal. Okay. Yeah. That's how the dog is acting. But doesn't I mean, matter it's that like it's an adult. The, this daughter doesn't even like the dog. She hardly acknowledges the dog anyway. And so, I mean, it's just so strange that she goes crazy to see this daughter whenever she could be gone five minutes and just walk was, back in the room. Let me ask you something. The scenario, your three-year-old walked out the door, you'd be pretty upset, wouldn't you? Right. <laughs> so when the dog comes back 20 minutes later, even though you're teed off at it, you're still jumping for joy, right? Right. Okay, so that explains that. And by the way, see dogs understand height, they don't understand size. So when they jump up, they elevate their status. When they stand up on you, they're elevating their status in the pack. And they're, of course, they're asking you who's in charge, you or me. And if you don't just push the dog away without making eye contact or talking, you, you're telling them they're in charge. So your so your suggestion is just ignore them, push them well, away. I don't want the dog jumping all over you. So there are other solutions. You know, if the dog, what you can do is just turn your body sideways to the dog. If okay. that doesn't stop it from, because that says I don't want to communicate with you. So if that doesn't stop the dog from jumping, what you can do is go back through the door you just came through, close it. So now you've separated again from the dog. Okay, they don't like to be separated from the pack. Count to 10, come back in. If it even lifts a paw like it's going to jump, you're going to go right back through that door again for another count of 10. And you're not going to stay in until it stops jumping on you. Right. Because the dog will get the idea. If I keep jumping, I'm going to keep losing you. Right. Now, I but mean, you still, but still, still, wait a minute, wait a minute. You still okay. need to go through the full reuniting routine. But okay. that'll stop the dog from jumping. Yeah, my, she doesn't always jump. The biggest thing was just so strange that she was always so glad. I mean, even if I get off the couch and I'm in the same room, if I move and get up, she's like all excited. You know, she's like, well, I don't know. Well, she's got to take care of you. You're the three year old child. She wants to make sure you don't go get in trouble. You know, <laughs> I guess. Okay. okay? Uh, this will that. change. When your dog follows you, please ignore it. Don't tell it to stop following you. Just go about your business. It'll get, you know, if there's nothing in it for the dog, it'll stop the behavior. It's only when the dog gets something out of it that it does the behavior. Christy, the way, did you have a question? I it did, it was, kind of, it was kind of the same question and uh, Mr. Phil answered it um, basically already because I was gonna say my dog does jump 
um, you know, every time we come in. And so what do I do to begin to correct that? Um, but then also um, piggybacking on the other lady's um, second part of her question, if I may, um, we have a, a second dog that does um, yip and yap every time somebody walks um, through the room. And it is mostly my, you know, it is mostly two particular children. So um, did I hear you correctly, Phil, that just don't correct them? I mean, what's the, what, why does a dog yip and yap? Or why do dogs yip and yap? Is get there any attention. reason, is there any particular reason other than they're trying to get the kids' attention? No, not necessarily. I mean, some, they, some of, sometimes they're like, um, you know, their, their feet are pounding. It is an old dog, like a, re, like a 14 year old, that dog's an old dog. Um, so I always, I always think you just can't tell who's coming through. And so therefore I'm gonna protect myself by barking, but I don't think that's really correct. I think they're trying to get the dog's attention. So they just ignore it. Just Perfect. go through, walk through. Okay. Now, the other thing they could do is not pound through the through the room. Right, you know? right, right. Those are my teenagers. <laughs> right. Yes, I know about trying to get teenagers to comply. My, <laughs> mine you. are all in their 30s now, but I do remember. Okay. Actually, they're good <laughs> kids. Um, the other thing is don't turn your back to the dog. Some people will tell you to turn your back. Well, you're vulnerable. Okay, you're, you're making yourself vulnerable to the dog. Why? Because the primary line of defense of a wolf and the primary line of defense for a dog are teeth. And you are more vulnerable when the dog can't see your teeth. And if you don't believe that this works this way, I, don't, I couldn't tell you where to find the video. It's in YouTube someplace. But it's a video of a wolf who stole a kill from two wolf, uh, uh, of a bear that stole um, a kill from two wolves. Well, two wolves are not going to fight a grizzly bear. But as soon as that bear left the kill and they didn't see its teeth anymore, they were all over its butt. Okay. Um, Linda, you have your hand raised. Some somebody's got a question here about. Um, yeah, we've got wonder, a question. How do I stop my dog from barking? Um, okay. I want to have Linda go because she, she right, and ahead. then we'll do the chat. All right. Okay. Um, I actually I put something in chat too. I have when I'm I stay frequently with my daughter and son-in-law who have a little dog, and um, actually I stay for an extended time and I'm going to be moving there. And what happens is the dog, um, whenever I be sitting in the room with them, and if I get up. The dog comes and barks like crazy at me. And also, it seems like if, if I come near my daughter, um, like if she's in her office and I come in the room to go near my daughter, um, the dog starts barking at me. So it, it just, yeah. it that, just that seems dog like is a protective of my daughter. That dog is a leader, is protecting your daughter. Okay. And you said, you said when you move, I mean, if you're just sitting there, the dog is okay, right? Yes. Okay, yes. so when you move, the dog is taking back control. That's why, because, because see, if a, if a dog, you know, if, if a dog is the leader, it doesn't feel safe in our world. And if it doesn't feel safe, it has to be in control and it won't give up control until it feels safe. And dogs, just like wolves are into movement. So you're more dangerous when you're moving. So that's why the dog is going, you know, is kind of going after you. And then when you get near your daughter, holy cow. You know, you're you're this dog has kind of picked your daughter as its uh as its female leader. And what the hell are you doing challenging the 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 the, the order of things in the pack? See, this is how they think. This may seem crazy to you, but this is how they think. So what right. do I do? What what do you what do you do is is you're not going to do anything. Your your dog. I mean, because this dog would bite you if you did anything, right? What your daughter is going to do is put the dog in a timeout. Don't make mm -hmm. eye contact with it. Don't talk to it. Just go you know, go close it into another room. Or if you're in a room that has a door, the two of you leave the room and leave the dog in the room for a count of ten. So that way it's mm -hmm. separated from the pack. They don't like to be separated from the pack. You, you guys could call me because I, I really haven't got time to go through this in detail, given the kind of con okay. time constraints we have. But timeouts are okay. a great way to eliminate that behavior. 
but you know, you got to understand the pack dynamics. Okay. Okay. You're you're trying to horn in on the in effect by be you know the dog is thinking oh no you're not you're not my you're not the female leader. You know you're trying to horn in on on the wrong turf. Okay. Um. Okay. So well we got a ton of questions in about twenty five minutes right. <laughs> Let, let me let me let me go through a couple of other things. All right, maintain your personal space. Very simple. Dog does not get into your space unless invited. It does not touch you unless invited. If it's if it get if it goes into your space, leans on you, lies on your feet, licks your face, okay, hops in your lap. Doesn't matter what it does or how good it feels. Your dog is showing you no respect. You have become the Rodney Danger field of the human world. Okay. So dog only gets into your space by invitation. So if the dog gets in your space without being invited, you're gonna push it away. Oh my God, I gotta do something terrible like that. Not you're not gonna hurt it, but you and you use this is what you gotta do. And if the dog makes a game out of it and persists, get up and walk away. And then when the dog is behaving, you can call it to you and give it all the love you want. All right. So that's that's the maintain personal space. Who is on the throne? Your bed is your throne. Okay. And your dog should be in it with you only by invitation. So if your dog jumps up without being invited, you're going to put it right back on the floor and block it with your hand or your leg to keep it from getting up on your bed. Because it's only should be up there by invitation. And oh, by the way, dogs are tricky in terms of trying to get attention because they'll sit there like a good dog. Oh, wow, my dog sat without it even being asked. That's great. No, it's not great. If it's staring at you because it's asking you who's in charge, you or me. So the dog has just faked you out. You got to wait until the dog is not staring at you to invite it up into your bed or uh, into your lap or wherever. OK, so that's that is the um, status area. Let's do food real quick. Wolves and dogs are predators, they're hunters, they are opportunistic eaters, and they are scavengers. What the heck does opportunistic eater mean? If you ever had a dog steal food off your counter, that's why it's stolen it. We are the only creatures on earth that know when our next meal is going to come, when it's going to occur. And if we didn't know that, we would steal food also because food is about survival. You're gonna grab it while you can if you don't know when you're going to get it again, right? Makes sense? So we, so um, that's what I mean by opportunity. And scavenger, this is why they go in your garbage. And by the way, dogs don't have classifications of food. Food is food, no matter where it comes from or what form is it's in, if it's edible, it's food. Now, in the wild, particularly if food is scarce, the leaders eat first. They eat the best parts of the kill. They eat all they want to eat. They eat undisturbed. Nobody bothers the leaders. And one, it's actually leader one eats first and when it leaves the kill, that's the signal to leader number two, it's your turn. Same thing happens, eats undisturbed, eats the best parts of the kill eats all it wants to eat. And when it leaves the kill, that's the signal to the next one in the pecking order. And oh, by the way, no wolf would ever leave the kill until it's done eating. There are no picky eaters in the wild. Picky eaters would die in the wild. Our dogs are picky eaters because they're trying to show us they control food. So how are we gonna mimic this in our world? You're going to eat a little bit of human food before you put the bowl down and step away all right so when it come, comes time to prepare your dog's meal you're going to get the bowl out um, if your starting preparation doesn't get the dog into the kitchen or wherever you're going to call it in then your interaction with your dog is going to end so you're going to first put the bowl out have a couple of tidbits of food 
near your dog's bowl. It could be a couple of grapes, could be a couple of pieces of cheese, whatever you eat, it's something you can eat quickly, okay? Uh, and you're, then you're gonna call your dog into the kitchen if it's not already there. No more interaction with your dog. Prepare its meal. If you're gonna feed it right off the counter, pick up tidbit number one, put it in your mouth, chew it up and swallow it. Pick up tidbit number two, put it in your mouth, chew it, start chewing on it, put the bowl down and step away. Give your dog enough space so you're not interfering with it. So what did the dog see? The dog saw that you ate first, you ate undisturbed, you didn't interact with it. You ate the best parts of the kill, you ate all you wanted to eat. And when you put that bowl down and stepped away, uh, that was the signal to the dog, it was it's his turn. If you carry the bowl to a different part of your kitchen or to a different room, don't eat until you get there. You have to eat your tidbits where you're gonna put the bowl down. See, to the dog, the bowl with the food is the kill. They can't relate to bowls. And by the way, so you're gonna do this gesture eating for two weeks. And then if things are going well there, then you, you, you're gonna cut back to one or two days a week. But there's something you can always do permanently. When your dog vacates the bowl, you're going to pick it up, mealtime is over. Doesn't matter whether they ate some of the food, none of it, or all of it, mealtime is over. If your dog didn't eat anything, you can try several hours later again. Your dog will not starve itself, okay? So that's that's the essence of uh, the feeding. What's the Leaders are the providers, they control food. This is gonna allow you to control food. So uh, other than you being the leader, is that just showing leadership, but other, is there another purpose for doing that? Why do I need well, to do that? Because it shows them leadership. It shows them you're in charge of food. Okay. Now, another way to show them that you are in charge of food is never give a dog food when it's seeking it. Because if you do, then you're telling them they're in charge of food. Don't leave a meat bowl down, a, a meat bone, you know, a nice fresh meat, bo meat bone down for the dog to access it whenever it wants. If they can access food whenever they want, that tells them they're in charge of food. That's why we always pick up the food bowl. The food bowl is the bones of the kill. See, they don't understand our world. They don't know what the hell a bowl is. All I know is that it's their food. You know, out of convenience, you, you put the uh, elk parts in a, in a bowl instead of on the floor, you know? Because that's, you know, again, they inherited their instincts from the wolf, okay? So that's the, that's the quickie with, uh, and oh, by the way, if your dog bugs you at a certain time to eat, guess what? It knows your routine. So if it, it can predict when it's supposed to get food, and you haven't got your lazy butt into the kitchen yet to feed it and it starts bugging you. By the way, I'm just trying to be funny. I'm not trying to insult anybody. Um, you know, you, then that's why the dog starts seeking food because it knows what time it's supposed to be fed. It can't tell time, but it knows your routine. So if your dog is doing that, change your routine. Don't feed it in the sa at the same points in your routine every day. Change up your routine, okay? So that's, and that's an important one. Uh, handling danger. Um, leaders decide subordinate pack members alert. In the wild, a, a, you know, a subordinate pack member may, may alert the pack to a danger by howling or barking. The, one, the leader number one, if it's available, comes over and checks it out. It's got three choices as to what to do, flight, freeze, or fight. What do you think the favorite choice of leader number one is in the wild? You know, the so-called big bad wolf. Flight, freeze, or fight. If those of you who think it's flight, please raise your hands. We don't have many takers for a flight. All the rest of you are wrong because their favorite choice is flight. No, no, because no. nobody gets hurt. So the leader would lead the pack away from the danger if it thought it couldn't handle the danger. And by the way, if the leader doesn't think it's a danger, it just calmly walks away. So how are we going to mimic this in our world? I mean, I'm cutting this a little bit short. Um, <clears throat> but the three-step process to show the dog, to demonstrate in a dog, you know, a, a, a way that your dog understands that you are in charge of handling dangers. Your dog starts barking about something on the outside, and I would do this if my dog started barking right now, 
is you're going to thank it for alerting you to the danger or whatever it's trying to alert you to because we want the dog to, to be a sentinel. We want to be alerted to a danger. But we also want to communicate that when it's not a danger, it's not a danger. So you're going to thank your dog. And so if my dog was named Fido, I would say, Fido, thank you, and then call him to me. And then when he got to me, he'd get praise, love, and or a food reward. All right, and if the dog doesn't go back and bark some more, you're done. So thank and call is the first step. Now, let's say your dog doesn't stop barking. It runs back to the window or door and, or never left it in the first place. You're going to go take a look. You may not see anything. It doesn't matter. You're going to turn to your dog, you know, because there was no danger. And, and again, you're staying calm. You're not getting upset. Unless you want to communicate to the dog it's a danger. Then your dog will, you know, be more up to bark at it. And, and bother you with barking, all right? In fact, you can make your dog hypervigilant by getting upset over dangers. Um, but anyway, you're gonna go take a look, turn to your dog, and if again, it's Fido, it, it was me, I would turn to the dog and say, thank you, come Fido, I'd invite it to come with me. And if that works, you're done. Now, what happens if your dog insists on continuing to bark at something outside that's not a problem? you're going to put it in timeout. So if your dog won't get, you know, get, uh, uh, you know, might not bite, if your dog won't bite you, you're gonna take it by the collar and put it in the nearest room and close the door for a count of 10 if it's quiet. Uh, and and um, if it's not quiet, it's a little bit of a different routine. But when you put it into timeout and you repeat the timeouts until the dog stops barking. I once put a dog in a timeout 20 times. It finally got the idea that if it didn't stay calm, it wasn't going to stay with the pack. So, so, uh, and by the way, if you want the article on timeouts, just shoot me an uh, an email at fillthedoglistener at gmail dot com. I'd be happy to send it to you. So what about there. outside? What about when they're outside? Good question. If they're outside, because oh, glad, glad you asked that. You don't have to go through reuniting for, for handling danger. Danger takes precedence. So regardless of where you are in your house, you can start the danger routine. You could be even in the bathroom and, and thank the dog for barking. Of course, if you're, the door is closed, you can't call the dog to you. And if you're indisposed, you can't go out and deal with the dog anyway. But if the dog is outside and you're inside, stick your head out the door and thank the dog and call it to you. And then you kind of do step two by going, if the dog doesn't stop barking, go out and take a look, get next to the dog, take a look and thank it again, invite it to come in with you. But you can't, you, it's too protracted to try to bring the dog in and give it a time out. If it doesn't stop barking, you're gonna go back inside, close the door, count to 10, and hopefully the dog stops barking. And if it doesn't, you start over, okay? When you are on the hunt, walk to us. If your dog starts fussing about something, you're going to thank it and take it away from whatever it's fussing about as fast as you can. You don't have to break into a sprint, but you keep taking it away until the dog is no longer concerned with it. In other words, it stops looking back. Now you've chosen flight, which is the dog's favorite choice in the face of danger, okay? Somebody's got a question here about what if it doesn't come? When when is that? When it's out in the yard? Yes. Yeah. Well, then if it doesn't come, you're going to go out and you're going to go out and take a look. But if you can't get control of it, you, your only choice is to go back inside and close the door. So you separate from the dog for a count of ten, and then you go back out, you, or you or you start over. You start the process over. They are barking at an actual something. Like there is, there are people walking by, or there is something that you know he thinks he yep. needs to protect. Well, there's, there's not, they're not actually dangerous. This dog is just doing this because it's protecting you. It's overreacting. People, right. you know, for the most part, people are not dangerous. Other dogs are not dangerous. The, uh, you know, the prime delivery truck is not a danger, but your dog thinks <laughs> it is because it's in a world it doesn't yeah. understand. And, right. and, and the more. The, you know, the more pressure on it, the more sensitive it is about taking care of you, the more high strung the dog is, the more it's apt to bark at things that are really inappropriate. 
And if you get upset with it, it's, you know, it's going to think you're barking too. This must be a big problem because you're going to help me get rid of it or kill it. Okay. If you, uh, if you get a chance later, can you just let us know like what, how we would handle that situation? If there isn't like, if the human knows that there isn't a danger, but the dog just is, I, or I guess, is it okay for the dog to bark at things that aren't? Well, see, well, see the thing is, except for when it's outside and you don't want to start chasing it around. If you're in the house, that dog is going to keep going to the time out if it doesn't stop barking. Right, right. But yeah, if you're outside. If you're outside, it's a, bit, a little bit more of a challenge. But again, you're going to stay calm because eventually that's, that's, a, that's a piece of how you get to be the leader. See, once the dog trusts your decision making, which it doesn't do right now, why should I trust you? You're a juvenile delinquent. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, so as you gain trust, the dog will trust more of these things. And, you know, this is repetition, you know, uh, taking the fleeing from a danger, thanking your dog and taking flight, getting it away from the danger has got to be repeated over and over again, or getting it away from prey. You can teach your dog not to pull when there's a squirrel or not to pull when there's a rabbit or whatever, um, by taking it, by thanking it and taking it away from, from the prey. Okay. So uh, the hunt. quick on that note, let me just ask, if the dog doesn't come, following her question, the dog's there barking at the neighbors, you say, Fido, come. And then event, if, can you treat the dog to get them to come? Um, I, I would, well, you could, yeah, you, could, you, 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 could, you could use a treat to get them to come, but don't make it an all and every time thing. Because right. then otherwise, otherwise you're going to, um, then it'll only come for treats. Right. Th thank you for mentioning that. You could treat the dog for coming. Yeah, in fact, you know, if it comes to you, give it a treat. Right. If it doesn't come though, when you call it, you know, don't give it a treat after you called it 10 times because then you're teaching it to come after 10 times. Right. Okay. Uh, last but not least, or actually play is last, but I'm not sure if we're gonna get to it, um, but the hunt. And the key is to understand is that you, you're the one that wants to lead the hunt. When you leave your house, you want the dog walking nicely by your side on a loose leash, and you want it walking nicely by your side on the walk, okay? That's what we're going for. And it will stay by your side and want to be there because it feels safe there if you are the leader. That's why it wants to stay there. Um, so practice calling your dog to you because every time it comes to you, you've sent it a leadership signal. You've got to get it to come to you to put the leash on, right? You always want to be calm and have your dog calm from start to finish. And you'll notice there it talks about uh, eliminating triggers. So if the dog gets excited about the leash and you got to wrestle it to put the leash on, that's a trigger. And the way you, you conquer that is wear the leash as a fashion accessory, assuming the dog doesn't jump on you, because that means the leash no longer has meaning to the dog. It doesn't mean we're going out on the hunt. Or if you're not willing to wear it, take it out when you're not gonna use it, put it down someplace where the dog can't reach it, and then keep moving it every minute or so until the leash has no meaning, all right? Uh, the key, so you want to you want um, to go out with your dog nicely by your side. It says go first, but I really mean it's walking nicely by your side when you go out the door, and you want it to do the same when you come back in. Um, there is um, there is an exercise that you're going to do to help show your dog leadership. We call it stop, start, change direction. You can call it follow the leader, I don't care. And what we wanna do is we wanna make you the decision maker on the hunt. In other words, you decide when to stop and where to go. So if you stop and your dog stops, who made the decision about stopping? You did, right? This is, this is not rocket science. If you change direction and your dog follows you, who made the decision about where you're going? You did, right? So you're gonna do this little exercise that we call stop, start, change direction, or you can uh, call it follow the leader. 
And I recommend you do a lot of it on the inside first because there's the least amount of distractions and dangers in your house. And do it with your dog when you take it to go out to the bathroom, okay? How do you do stop, start, change direction? You just two, there's a couple of ways. If you want to do it with the dog by your, always by your side, then call the dog to your side, give it a food reward if it comes to your side, and then give it a command if you want. You're going to stick another treat down in front of its nose. Give it a command like heal or hear or follow, whatever you want to use, but use it consistently. Um, and then start walking forward. And if your dog follows you at least one step, give it, another, give it praise and give it another treat. And then do it again. So the idea is, and by the way, some with some dogs, if you get them to take one or two steps, and maybe you all are way beyond this, that's success. But you'd like to be able to take four or five steps, stop, and turn, and retrace your steps. So now you've done one loop. So you keep doing this for five minutes or so, five to 10 minutes, which gives you the chance to blitz your dog with leadership signals because the decisions about when to stop and where to go are leadership signals. Another way to do this stop, start, change direction or follow the leader is to go forward four or five steps or backpedal four or five and backpedal four or five steps. On the resources page on my website, there is the sole video of me because I'm video shy, not for this, um, uh, demonstrating stop, start, change direction with my, with, with my pooch. If you Google, or I mean YouTube, go on YouTube and search for stop, start, change, direction, you'll find Tony Knight doing a demonstration. Uh, Nigel Reed does a, does a, there's a nice nine minute video on leading the hunt. Uh, Tony also does a video on how to get out the door first and get back in first, again, with the dog by your side, basically. Uh, and I like a Caroline Spencer video also. And if you can't find these things, please don't spend a ton of time on it. Just ask, email me and ask me for the information, the, the links to these videos. I'd be happy to send them to you. The same thing with Stop, Start, Change Direction. Okay, so you can actually get the gesture reading video from me also. All right, so, and by the way, your dog does get to stop, make that decision when it's got to go to the bathroom. You don't want to drag it around when it's trying to go to the bathroom, okay? Play, real quick, is simple. Toys are trophies in the canine world. Your dog should not have access to a whole basket of toys because then you're helping it collect trophies. If you have a dog, I would recommend that it only has access to maybe a couple of toys and a couple of chew bones, that kind of thing, you know, nyla bones, whatever. Not a whole bunch of stuff. You can rotate toys. But if you want to be the leader, you choose the toy, you use it to initiate play, you make up the rules of the game, and you end the game. What's the rules of the game? Whatever game you decide. So if you want it to play fetch, it's got to follow the rules. When you say fetch, give it the command to fetch, it's got to go fetch. When you say come, it's got to come. When you say drop it or leave it, whether it's on the ground or in your hand, it's got to do it. So if you've got all that done, then you had your first successful iteration of fetch. If the dog runs past you, won't give you the ball, won't chase it in the first place or the frisbee, whatever, game is over because it's making up the rules. That's what I mean. So just have it chase balls. That's a much simpler game. You can continue the game as long as your dog chases balls. Okay, so um, I don't know, can we can we run a little bit over time, Leah, for the uh, for questions? Yeah, um, we can wrap up the presentation and anyone who has questions is welcome to stay. Okay, so I so I I I'm done with what I'm presenting. I guess you you guys have been wonderful. I would and if those of you have questions, want to ask questions, please stay. And the other thing is don't hesitate to give me a call or shoot me a text. Uh, we're going to wind up talking anyway, because I'm not going to send you a long email. It's not going to do you any good because um, we need live interaction. <laughs> I've learned through the years that, you know, sending out lots of stuff in writing does not, you know, mean that we're on the same page, that we're, we're having the same meaning to somebody. 
So I, I, I want to have live interaction with you. And my, by the way, I don't charge for phone calls. Unless you decide to hire me, you don't pay me. Okay. Lots of thank yous in the chat. What? Lots of thank yous in the chat. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure doing this with you. I just wish thank we could you. be in person. That's all. Hi, Phil. Thank you. Yeah. I do have one question. Um, yes. My dog, whenever he's resting on a floor, whether it be a carpet or you know a hardwood floor or whatever, he licks the floor. Okay, that's that's that can be an obsession. It's a sign of stress. That tells me, and I you know I can't be one hundred percent that that it tells me this, but but my strong suspicions are is your dog is the leader and it's trying to work off stress. See, any any behavior, obsessive behavior, is a sign that the dog is under duress. If your dog is hyperactive, if your dog has separation anxiety, if your dog generally has a lot of anxiety, that, that indicates that it is the leader and cannot cope with the job. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks. I have a quick comment. Go ahead. Um, it's not really a question. I just wanted to say I like your hat and I wish you were a uh, Yankees whisperer the way they've been playing lately. But thank, <laughs> thank you for all of it. It's been very helpful. We have a, a young Havanese that's eight months old and uh, this is going to be really helpful to put me back towards track. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Good night. Thank Good night. You. Who else? I have, I have a question. Yes. Okay. Um, my my dog <clears throat> is normally very well behaved. She's very sensitive, but when we have people over and there's excitement, especially little kids, she she really she gets excited and she starts humping everybody. <laughs> she starts humping, you know, like my leg or somebody else's leg. And that, I know that's usually like trying to be dominant, but I don't know what do I do about that. I mean, we usually just you know like push her off, but is there something? Well, Why yeah, she, your, your, there... your dog is in charge is trying to see this is about status in the pack. So when people come in, it changes the pack dynamics. They got to know where they fit and who's in charge. So this okay. is what the this, this is what the humping is about. Yes, it's embarrassing sometimes, <laughs> but you know, but this is what it's about. So you want to take back leadership. The other thing is if it's if it humps you, you got you know you what you could do is if it's you know if this is persistent behavior, stick the dog into timeout. Or you go into another room and close the door so the dog is separated from you. It loses you. So you know? if somebody, so if we're, you know, we're all playing. I've had my little great nieces over, and she comes over and you know humps my my niece, a grown niece, um, because my niece is on the floor playing. She, she, do I take her? Do I take You're her? You're going to escort her into that dog right into timeout. Okay. No eye contact, no talking, no petting, you know, taking it by the collar and escorting it does not constitute interaction that's going to make your dog think it's the leader. All right. Every time your dog humps somebody, it loses the pack. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, and you're probably going to want that article on timeouts. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. And thank you very much for. It's you're welcome. My pleasure. Phil, there was a, a question in the chat. I don't know if you saw. Um, do you have information on redirected aggression? Um, well, I, I would need more information, but typically with that, uh, aggression is a dog that's overreacting because it's scared. And, and um, if you can do it, you know, it depends on the circumstances, whether the dog is aggressive on the outside the house or inside the house or both. Inside the house, you could put the dog into timeout unless you think it's going to bite you, okay? <clears throat> or you can put your close yourself into another room. The dog is still separated from the pack. But I need to know a lot more because I'm not comfortable with it. I'm giving the right uh, advice. But typically, and by the way, teeth on skin or teeth on clothing, even mouthing, is unacceptable behavior. So the dog should be put in mouth put in timeout for. Uh, grabbing clothing or um, um, mouthing, wrists, hands, things like that. It's not really cute behavior. The dog is, is basically trying to control you. 
And it could be dangerous because dogs' teeth are sharp. Uh, she question. says that the question asker is going to email you. Okay, good. that's great. I look forward to it. Um, Alyssa asked in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry, Don, you go ahead. Okay. Um, so we have a, a dog. We, we, we have a couple of beagles. We've always had a number of beagles. And this is our younger one. And he has a very severe reaction. Uh, we had another dog come over one time and he got his back up and he was barking and it seemed like he was you know, really afraid and very frantic about it. He also, when we have people over, he stays away from them. He's getting a little better now. He'll sometimes come up and sniff them. But uh, um, it's, we're, we're, what's that? Yeah, he seems like he's afraid. Yeah, he is. Um, he is afraid. He can't see. He can't cope with this. Um, and, and you know that that see if he stays away, that's flight. The dog has taken flight, even if it doesn't leave the room, even if it's just backing off and staying away from the people. It you know that's where it feels comfortable. So don't force any interaction. Um, the other thing you might want to consider is is um, you know if you've got, I mean, is it just one person over that he starts doing this, or do you have to have a whole bunch of people over? It could be one person. Uh, okay. It doesn't have to be a big group. And yeah, and the other yeah. thing is that... By the way, uh, the solution is for you guys to take back pack leadership. So, time out. Because the dog is thinking he's got to protect you and he's and he can't cope with this. And the, the other reason why we're concerned about it was we wanted to get another dog. We had just lost a dog. And I'm uh, sorry about that. Thank you. And, and we just weren't sure how he was going to react to this new dog because... Well, that, that could work out well if the other dog is above him in the pack, okay? But it could be a disaster if he thinks now he's got another pack mate to protect. So, so having, like he's a male, I, I, having, a, I, having gonna, a female may not be a good idea. No, I got let me be clear about this. I always recommend to people get it right with the dog you have before you get another dog. What okay. you do is, your, is, you know, that's your choice and I respect that. But my recommendation is get it right with the dog you have before you add a dog. Okay. okay, so he's got to be more socialized with strangers. Well, it's not a matter of socialization. It's a matter of you guys regaining pack leadership. Now, socialization probably is going to wind up being part of that. But, it, but you know, if you expose him to more dogs and he's got to protect you and he's, he's, he might get more scared, it could make matters worse. I don't know if you're Thank seeing you. this happening at Eric's house. But the dog. I see somebody raising their hand over here. <laughs> Trying to get... My that son was on the couch. I'm trying to get her off without giving her. And she immediately went back. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, you know. <laughs> if you want, to just us. push her off without looking at them. Don't make eye contact. So you can look at your dog. Just don't make eye contact. Push the dog <laughs> off the couch. It's okay to do that. Um, we did have a couple of questions in the chat. I wanted to get to, um, real quick, and then we'll get to everybody else. Um. My dog does not pull on walks, but she's very timid and freezes. She is strong and not easily redirected with a tug on the leash. How do I handle this? Uh, on the walk, you said? Yes. yes. Okay, so if, what? So your dog is pulling you to where? Just all the time or some of the time? No, she, do, she doesn't pull she, uh, at all. Like she, she, um, here, I'm trying my, she, she freezes, like she, oh. she Okay. How far are you from your home when the dog freezes? Um, it's, it's when I take her, uh, try to take her on a walk, uh, like on a trail or something. If okay, she's with what, a, what, another she's dog, she's fine. Okay, what, she sent, she's telling you something. And I'm glad you asked this because it's, because this, this is a very clear communication. If mm -hmm. your dog freezes on the hunt, it's telling you, oh, we got to go back. I don't feel comfortable out here with this job of having to protect you. So I yes. what I would do is I'd start doing the stop, start, change direction in your yard. If you have a yard, don't even leave the yard. You don't have to leave the yard. See, you, you all think that the and people people think this way, and I understand it because I used to think the same way. And you got a lot of trainers telling you this, that your dog is misbehaving because it's not getting enough exercise. Well, the instincts of a dog is to conserve energy for the hunt, just like it is for the wolf. I saw a video where where a half a pack of wolves. Slept for 18 hours straight. You think they were worried about getting exercise? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so it's not exercise that causes 
the problem, lack of exercise that causes the problem. It's your interactions with your dog. In fact, think of this. If exercise would cure behavioral problems, all world-class athletes would be angels. <laughs> I'm not telling you to not exercise your dog, but I can't give you a prescription. You know, if you've got a fenced in yard and throw, get your dog to chase balls for five minutes, that's probably all the exercises it needs. So but if you so want to do more, if you like going for walks or running with your dog, that's fine. As long as it can cope be, with being with you. But if it freezes, it's telling you, we got to go back. I'm not comfortable. And that's what she wants to do. She immediately wants to go back to the car. Yep. And so in the yard, we have an invisible fence. What do I... But do I put her on leash in the yard and practice? Yeah, I would, I would take the dog out there and do stop, start, change direction with it. Okay. Okay, start near your house first because she's going to be more comfortable there. And, you know, you can do a bunch of it in your house because that's the safest place. But you could go out and do 10, 20% of it in your yard for beginners. Your dog is going to be more comfortable near your house because think of the house as the wolf den. The further you get away, the less comfortable your dog is. So the inside of your house is like the shallow end of the pool. We're going to relate this to swimming lessons. Your yard is like the middle, but you can still touch bottom. When you get beyond your yard, at some point, you're in the deep end. You don't learn how to swim in a deep end. You learn mm -hmm. to, sw to swim in the shallow end. So do 80% of the stop, start, change direction in your house and do the other 20% outside. I'm giving you a rough guideline as the dog gets you know, more calm, you're, you're gaining progress. You can do more, do more stuff on the outside uh, and less stuff on the inside. Make sense? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that stop start, so I'll have to Google it. Yeah. Or, or you can, you know, you can contact me. Thank you very much. I, I don't um, want any, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I consider myself a dog advocate and I want dogs to be, feel safe and secure in our world. Um, we, this is very good uh, and timely. Uh, any recommendations on what to do with a dog who is distraught with fireworks? Okay, great. So I, I actually did this with my, with my dog while we were, um, while, while we were doing this. So this, while we we're having this session. Um, this is another time where you can go to your dog if you have to. But if it starts getting, see, if, if your dog will flee, and, and I'm not trying to be funny here either, goes into the bathtub and is okay, or goes into a closet and is okay, that's a good thing. Because it's taken flight, right? When it heard thunder or fireworks. But you know, if it's shaken like a leaf, it can't get calm, then it would be a good thing for you to take the dog by the collar, go sit with it someplace, hold it against you, with, you know, keep a hand on it, don't talk or make eye contact or pet it. Because just by doing, see, remember we talked about flight, freeze, or fight? We're now doing a calm freeze or a calm hold with the dog, which if you stay calm, there's no interaction other than you holding the dog against you, okay? Eventually the dog is going to relax because you are acting calm. It tells the dog, this is not a problem. You know, it's nice, calm, quiet uh, uh, technique. And it tells the dog, this is not a problem. I got you covered. I got your back covered. That's the message to the dog. You might have to repeat it. I remember one time there was a line of thunder showers went through when a, uh, actually three lines of thunder showers went through when I was doing a consultation up in Windsor Locks. I did a calm hold with a dog for an hour and 25 minutes while I was doing the consultation. That was way out there you know the next longest one was like about i don't know half an hour usually it's 10 15 minutes when you feel your dog relax let it go and if you might have to repeat it okay so it's just basically getting a dog by your side hold it holding it against you uh you can sit in a chair when you're doing this or you know sit on the couch with it or whatever um right now my dog is right next to uh me on the floor and you didn't probably see it, but when she was standing up, I was had my hand on her until she relaxed and lied down. Okay, good question. Um, <clears throat> we have 
I have a seven month old dog who is crated at night. The crate is in a separate room from main living. I am starting to worry that I may be correcting him inadvertently by separating him from us. I treat him when he goes in the, I treat him when he goes in the crate, but after hearing you tonight, I'm thinking maybe I should move the crate to be with us. So he doesn't think we are moving him from us to change behavior. I, I you know, you're, you're, you're not coming through uh, the, your volume is, is, I'm not hearing you that well. So the question is, uh, basically they have a puppy and they're currently crate training it in a separate room. Um, and they're worried that by separating the dog from them, um, that they're maybe um, correcting it in, inadvertently by separating it. Um, well, what, what, what's, is it having any behavioral issues in the crate or about the crate? Sarah, can no, you, uh, hey, yeah. sorry, I've got I got my little uh, other little Hi. training here, so I have my. <laughs> um, yeah, he's he's a really good puppy. Um, I just I you know I've never had a puppy before, and I don't want to I don't want to like <laughs> you know after hearing like about correcting and you know timeouts and moving him, I just don't want to have a habit of him thinking or removing him. There doesn't seem to be any behavior with it. You know he you know I'll say like go into bed and he'll he'll go in the crate and he'll take a treat. Um, you know, we do have like a lot of kids, so it's kind of noisy sometimes. So I had originally put the crate kind of in another room because I thought it would be quiet for him. Um, yep. But I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, if that's the right idea or not. Well, you know, if he's happy in the crate, he's, he's doing fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. Okay. If he's um, not so happy in the crate, then, you know, then you want, you would want to, is, is the crate near your room? No, so the crate isn't, we have like a mud room. So originally when he was, when he was like, act, you know, I was worried about accidents. I had him in a mud room because there's tile floor. So that's okay. kind of why we put it there. Um, but, um, you know, it is kind of away from us though. It's away from the family room, away from bedrooms. Um, so he's not with us during that time. Um, I mean, he seems happy with it. Um, my only question is if we do time out, I haven't used that yet, but after hearing today, I, I definitely think there's some behaviors like jumping up um, that I would use it. I, I assume I should use a different room so that he doesn't associate like crazy. Yeah, I would I would just put him into the nearest room because otherwise it's a you know if you're having to go through a few rooms it's kind yeah, of protracted. Right. By the time he gets into timeout, he may not know why he's going into timeout. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Okay. okay so, so I mean by the way, if you got a bathroom nearby, bathrooms are great because they're easy to dog proof. Yeah, and right. He, and he's not going to be in timeout for very long. But if the crate is working where you got it, I, th yeah, I think it's fine. Right. If you find that, you know, the dog is not feeling, is not happy about being in the crate, that's a different story. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's Some good. dogs feel trapped in a crate. And, you know, I, I um, you know, I've seen situations where dogs will actually harm themselves trying to get out of the crate. They're so unhappy about being in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's definitely, he definitely seems to be fine with it. You know, he's, he's gotten more reliable. So we've been taking him out, you, you know, obviously all during the day, but even at night, we've been putting him um, to bed sort of later and later to be with us. But, um, but we still do put him in there at night. And I just wanted to make sure I wasn't like creating a situation where he was like thinking that that was a bad thing. Well, you know, you know, the thing is, if it's working, you don't need to fix it. Yeah. Okay. If it's not broken. Don't fix it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. We, and we actually have a couple questions about cars. So um, instruction for dogs who are anxious riding in the car and also a dog that won't get into a car that won't get into the car. There's, so there's two questions from different people. Oh, okay, um, so basically your dog is afraid to be in the car. Someone's car, someone's dog is afraid to be in the car and another person's dog doesn't want to get in the car, which I assume That's is also That's also being fear of the car because they don't understand our world. They don't understand cars. The other thing is if a dog is in the car, think about it. I mean, if it's not coping with handling dangers when it's in your home, now it's in a vehicle. It's lost its ability to flee. It may even think it can't even freeze and the dangers are flying by. So the dog has, you know, it, it thinks it's responsible for your survival. It thinks you're, it's your parent, but it doesn't know what to do because it can't handle the dangers. So that's why the, you know, the dog is acting with um, fear. It, it's, it's kind of a desensitize, you have to desensitize the dog to your car and and it's a kind of, who's got that problem now? Me. <laughs> I do. Why don't, you give, why don't you give me a call? Because this, this is kind of a long story to fix it. You're basically going to desensitize the dog by going through different steps. 
I would do stop, start, change direction toward and away from the car door. Once you get it comfortable by doing that, because you're showing it leadership, you know, just stick it in the back seat, close the Again, door. He, he, he just braces himself. He needs 70 pounds. Okay. All right. So you, you would need a lot of, you need to do a lot of stop, start, change direction toward and away from the car door. Eventually, the dog is going to buy into going into the into the car. So you start with the door closed. You open the door. You don't try to force it in. Eventually, you'll be able to walk it into the um, uh, the the seat. So once you get it to stay in the seat, the next step is for you to get in the front. The next step after that is for you to turn the car on and off. The next step after that is to uh, back down the driveway and come back up the driveway. So you're, you're in baby steps acclimating your dog to the car. Well, once we physically get him in the car, he just freezes. He stays like a statue the entire time we're in the car. But what other than taking him to the vet, why do you need to get him in the car? Well, our old dog used to come everywhere with us. So we like to, you know, go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a munchkin, but he won't even eat it. He's terrified. Yeah, so I wouldn't, I, I, okay, so you've got a dog with a different personality I don't know, you know, if you guys are leaders, he may wind up being the way your old dog was, but you're going to have to give him time. It's not going to happen fast. Yeah, he's I, a rescue, I, I, so we have no idea what happened to him. It doesn't matter what happened to him. I'm not trying to be, you know, sarcastic or anything. Yeah, they come with baggage and that does matter. But basically, it's how you interact with him that matters. Forget about the past because you can't do anything about it anyway. Mm -hmm. Become the leader's and then your dog will feel safe in our world. And it probably will go almost anywhere with you in the car. But you're looking, you're looking to a journey here. This is not going to happen instantaneously. Okay. I did a, I did a consultation with a couple uh, in East Hampton, have a good size, uh, you know, camper, trailer, whatever you want to call it, uh, RV that they towed with a truck. The dog was so scared they thought it was going to have a heart attack. So, <laughs> so the woman did a desensitization. It took a whole month and she worked hard, very hard with this dog to get it to stop being afraid of the RV. They drove all the way to Maine without a problem from Connecticut. That was lucky to be able to do it in a month, let me tell you. But she yeah, worked we've, very, we've tried. very hard with that dog. We've left the doors open in the van. We've, we've put food in there. You know, if I stuck a lion inside your house and said, go in, <laughs> could I, could I, could I uh, uh, entice you to go into your house? No. <laughs> well, that's, that, you know, so that, you, you got the analogy. Okay. Um, I think we can take one more question. Okay. Otherwise, you guys can contact Bill just because I have to call it a night. Because <laughs> I'm okay, no, I understand. I hope, we're, I hope I'm not, we're not overstaying our welcome. Oh, you're fine. I you're just, not going to uh, invite us over, Leah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, what was I going to say? Um, Anybody have a question? Please, one more question. Yeah, we, there's one in the chat. I just want to say, if you have more questions, please contact Phil. Um, I'll put his phone number and email in the chat again while he's talking. Um, we have a question from Kim. When my dog plays with our neighbor's dog, he will sometimes try to bite her neck while they are running and playing. What do we do to stop it? Well, it depends on whether this is just play and it doesn't look harmful or one or, or the dog is trying to do harm. Okay, uh, so it's hard, it's hard for me to tell. I mean, when they go for the neck, especially the underside, that's, that's, a, that's a, a kill position. That's not to say the dog wants to kill. I mean, it could just be being playful. So I need to, I'd have to, I, can, can somebody, can you send me a video? Can I get a video of it? Kim, can you clarify a little bit? I thought I hit up you, but I apparently must have clicked it twice. So Leslie's with me, she's my neighbor. Um, we do play dates all the time and you know, her dog, Nikki, is 84 pound New Foodle, Newfoundland, Newfoundland, um, and New Foodle, <laughs> whatever. New, uh, and my dog, is, um, he's 46 pounds, but they play together very well usually. And every so often, they'll be running together and going for the ball, and he, my dog will jump, and he tries to, like, bite Nikki's neck. Like, it's, it's usually, like, kind of the side or the top from the back. Um, so I'm guessing it's playing and she'll get ticked off sometimes and, you know, 
bark. Well, I, you know, so, so you know, you think the dog is trying to draw blood? No, I don't think so. Okay, but I, what you could do is, why don't you stop the play before it gets to that level? Well, <laughs> we try, but they're fast runners. It's kind of hard to uh, sometimes. Um, yeah, you know, but they're, but that. but they're, but, it, but it's stimulated by throwing a ball, isn't it? Did I get that right? You did. Yes. Okay, so I I would I would um, you know not let it uh, escalate to that point. All right. Well, now, if you could send me a video, I'd be much better able to make a you know a, a better judgment about it. Yeah. So because if, it's, it's it's not all the time, and it's not like sometimes it could be they could be playing for twenty minutes, no problem, and then he'll start doing it. Um, and sometimes he won't do it at all. And you know, it's it's not every time. It's not like at a certain point in time. Um, yeah. Okay. It's probably more annoying to me than it is to the dogs. <laughs> okay. I've got an Android phone, so if you've got an iPhone, please uh, use the WhatsApp video okay. app so that it'll be compatible with my phone. I have an Android. So okay, I good. So it'll be compatible no matter what you use. Okay. Okay. So all next right. Thank you all time. very much. I don't want to, you know, we're, I don't want to wear out my welcome here. <laughs> thank so, you. Um, a recording will be available on our YouTube, on the library's YouTube account later this week. Um, but definitely get in touch with Phil. He's awesome. And as you all know that now, and uh, yeah, everybody have a great night. Thank, thank you, thank so you much again, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you, Phil. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Phil. It was really helpful. Thank have you. Fun. Have fun with your thank dog. Thank you, Library, for setting it up. You're very okay. welcome. Everybody have a All good right. night. Okay, good night, folks. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you.